USGS. Uh, we are the sole science agent, Earth Science Agency for the U.S. Department of the Interior. And the USGS is tacked, tasked with providing impartial information on the health of our ecosystems and our environment, among other things. And one of our many goals is to communicate that information to other federal and state agencies. We're not a regulatory agency, and I'm not advocating for any particular public policy. But rather, uh, my goal today is to share with you what we've learned during our about 10 years of research on this subject. How did the USGS get involved in PAHs and pavement sealants? It might seem like a bit of a stretch, but it was a very natural outgrowth of the work that we've been doing with the National Water Quality Assessment Program, uh, evaluating contaminant <coughs> trends in time um, using lake sediment cores. So basically using lake sediment cores to go back in time to look at contaminant histories in watersheds. And one of our principal goals is to identify trends and then explain why those trends are occurring. Now, some of the trends that we've identified are things like downward trends across the United, St the United States in lakes uh, for contaminants like DDT and PCBs uh, that were banned. We see a lot of each one of these symbols is a lake that we've cored, and the downward arrows indicate a statistically significant downward trend. A surprise to us were the upward trends that we saw in PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and these were primarily in urban lakes across the United States. And so we were very curious to find out why PAHs were increasing in concentration. Um, coincidentally and simultaneously with the research that we were doing on lake sediments and PAHs, here at the city of Austin, which is where um, I'm located at the Texas Water Science Center here in Austin. Uh, and the city of Austin uh, was using a grant from EPA to collect and analyze sediments from small urban streams and drainages. These were not in heavy industrial or inner city areas. These were in, in areas of light commercial, uh, multifamily and single family residential uh, housing. And they were analyzing a very wide suite of contaminants. And they saw something uh, that was very surprising when it came to PAHs. They were measuring concentrations in the thousands of ppm in some of these areas. Um, this is a real eye-opener because these concentrations are on par with what are typically measured in soils at Superfund sites. They're not at all what we would expect to be seeing in residential areas. Um, just to put these into context, the probable con effect concentration, in other words, the concentration at which we would expect to see adverse effects on benthic biota, is only 23 parts per million. So these were extremely elevated concentrations. They shared this data with us because we have a number of, of collaborative, cooperative programs with the city. and, and uh, it was a real eye-opener for us. In fact, at first we thought that the laboratory had put a decimal point in the wrong place. But it turned out that they weren't. And a very astute staff member with the city of Austin uh, was walking watersheds, and he walked upstream. And he noticed that the most contaminated sediments were just below parking lot drainages. And the parking lots were coated with a black substance, and that substance is coal tar-based seal coat. Seal coat is a consumer product that is marketed as enhancing the appearance of asphalt pavement and pre preserving or, or extending the longevity of the underlying asphalt. There are two brands of, or excuse me, two formulations of pavement sealer. There is one with an asphalt base which is used primarily west of the Continental Divide. And there's one with a coal tar based, which is used primarily east of the Continental Divide. And these products are sprayed or painted on. They are, can be applied by homeowners or property owners, or you can hire someone to do it. It is not an intrinsic part of the pavement process. It is an um, optional product that can be used 
after paving. It's not used on roads. It's primarily used on parking lots, on driveways, and even on some playgrounds and sidewalks. This turns out to be a concern because the coal tar-based pavement sealants contain anywhere from 15 to 35 percent coal tar pitch, crude coal tar, uh, one or the other, um, either coal tar pitch or now some of them are starting to use crude coal tar. And both crude coal tar and coal tar pitch are known human carcinogens. So these have the potential to give to be very potent source sources of, uh, of PAHs to the urban and residential environment. Coal tar and coal tar pitch are a concern because, among other compounds, they contain very high concentrations of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. PAHs are compounds that have the benzene ring as a building block, and as we combine different numbers of benzene rings in different geometric configurations, each one of these is a PAH. Uh, these can be modified by adding uh, additional constituents like nitrogen or sulfur uh, to one of the carbons and create um, heterocyclic compounds that also have important environmental and health considerations. Um, seven of the PAHs are probable human carcinogens, uh, and that number is uh, growing as the EPA is modifying uh, what they believe to be, prob have probable cause to believe are human carcinogens. There are a very large number of sources of PAHs in the urban environment because PAHs are formed whenever we burn or combust organic matter. So when we burn a cigarette or we char meat or we heat up motor oil in our cars, we're creating PAHs. And similarly, products that involve organic matter combustion, like tires, um, also contain PAHs. And we're going to add to this list of urban PAH sources, then, the coal tar-based pavement sealants. The fact that there are so many urban sources has been one of the reasons that, for a long time, it's been very difficult to determine which of these sources uh, are the most important in the environment. Um, so one thing that's very helpful is to put the concentrations of PAHs in these sources into some context. So here we're looking at concentrations of PAHs in urban sources. You can see that while asphalt does contain PAHs, it has relatively low concentrations. And that's why uh, when the city was in Austin was looking around to determine where these PAH concentrations were coming from, we were discarding the possibility that they were coming from either fresh or weathered asphalt surfaces because these mm -hmm. concentrations are far lower than the 1,500 milligrams per kilogram that were measured in the sediments. So in fact, even used motor oil, which is, is one of the, the major um, sources of PAHs in urban environments, if you mixed used motor oil with some of those sediments in Austin, you'd actually be cleaning it up. If we take a look at the two different formulations of seal coat products, the asphalt-based product, like asphalt itself, has relatively low concentrations. But the coal tar-based product has very high concentrations. These can range anywhere from 50,000 parts per million all the way up into the hundreds of parts per million, depending on the manufacturer and the particular brand of seal coat that were, that's in question. Again, to put this into context, a bucket of coal tar seal coat off the shelf contains about 100 times more PAHs than a similar volume of used motor oil. These products are used extensively uh, in primarily in the eastern United States. I mentioned east of the Continental Divide, so that's the Great Lakes region, the northeast, uh, the southeast, the Midwest, and here in Texas. That rule is not hard and fast. There is some use of the coal tar-based products in the West, and there is some use of the asphalt-based products in the East. Um, but that, this, this, uh, we first heard about this geographic difference um, as anecdotal um, information from, from applicators, and, and our investigations since then have, um, that information has held up. Uh, 
about 85 million gallons of coal tar based steel coat are used every year in the United States, enough to cover about 170 square miles. And many applicators recommend that uh, seal coat be reapplied everywhere from two to every five years. And many homeowners prefer to reapply to their driveway on a yearly basis. It's really, if you live in these, if, if, if you uh, live in almost anywhere in the United States and you look around at parking lots and driveways, you will see seal coat. It's used on commercial properties. It's used at schools. It's used at churches. Uh, it's used in shopping centers, uh, universities. Um, it's, it's a very, very commonly used product in the United States. The issue is that the PAHs and, and the seal coats themselves don't stay where they're put. So after seal coat is applied, it makes a black, shiny surface, and it makes the, the, uh, the pavement look like new. But after a few months to years of abrasive action from car tires, and in many parts of the country, snow plows, it, it doesn't take long to start seeing some of the underlying asphalt showing through as the product abrades and is removed. Uh, and ultimately, after a few years, an asphalt parking lot or a private drive will start to look something like this. And if we go out and we just sweep up some of the dust that's on these sealed surfaces, you see all these little black bits. And these are little bits of seal coat. They are loose. They're mobile. They can be blown by wind and inhaled. They can be washed off by stormwater runoff. They can stick to our skin. Uh, they can to our shoes and be tracked to other locations. So there's lots of places that these little particles can go. And part of our research has focused on identifying the effects of coal tar seal coat on all of these different environmental compartments to which these particles can be transported. Some PAHs also are volatile, meaning they can evaporate into air. And some of our work also has focused on determining how important coal tar seal coat is as a contributor of PAHs to air. So we're going to walk through some of, of these compartments. We're going to start with the dust itself. As part of our work for the National, Quality Assess National Water Quality Assessment Program, we go around to lakes across the United States and we collect sediment cores. And in the course of that work, we also swept parking lots. I, I, I love my job. We get to get out and, and sweep up parking lots in all over the United States. And we measured the concentrations of PAHs in that parking lot dust. And what you're seeing here uh, confirms what we had heard from the industry about the use of the low PAH asphalt products used in the West and the use of the high PAH coal tar products used in the East. These concentrations are very consistent with what was measured in that, those, some of those stream beds in Austin, Texas, suggesting that there, some of those very small stream beds are getting almost completely undiluted runoff from some of these parking lots. And they're similar to what we see at Superfund sites. Now, we also swept off dust from unsealed parking lots. And we saw a very different story. We saw much lower concentrations of PAHs, even in the east. And these, water, these, these parking lots that we swept are all in the same watersheds they're in the same air sheds. Um, and so really, the difference between these numbers are pointing out that these high concentrations really are the result of the seal coat, because these unsealed parking lots are getting all the same other urban PAH sources, like uh, car tire uh, fragments and dripping motor oil and even atmospheric emissions. emissions. The mobile particles then can get washed down storm drains, and storm drains end up in streams which ultimately flow to lakes. So one of the big questions that we were interested in as part of the NACWA program is, are these products contributing to the upward trends that we're seeing in PAHs and urban lakes? And the approach that we used is called a, an environmental forensic approach. In other words, we used the profiles, the PAH profiles or fingerprints of different PAH urban sources, and we compared those to the PAH fingerprint in the sediment samples that we were collecting. Um, what do I mean by a PAH fingerprint? Well, 
there's a whole range of different sizes and shapes of PAHs, and different sources contain different proportions of those PAHs. And we used a statistical model that was um, developed by US EPA that says, what is the optimal way that I can combine different PAH sources and best replicate the PAH profile or the PAH fingerprint that we see in the sediments themselves? <laughs> so when we do that, we tested 22 different urban PAH sources, and we divided those into five large categories. Fuel coat products, vehicle-related PAH sources, coal burning, oil burning, and wood burning. And what we're looking at here is urban lakes that we've sampled across the United States. This is the PAH concentration on the y-axis, the total PAH concentration. And the different colors of the bars are telling us apportioning the PAHs to one of these different five PAH uh, source groups. And what it's showing us is that on the basis of the PAH fingerprints, we're estimating that overall about 50% of the PAHs in the urban lakes that we've sampled are coming from coal tar-based seal coat. And furthermore, if we look at the new urban lakes where we see the most pronounced upward trends in PAHs, overwhelmingly those PAHs are coming from coal tar-based seal coat. I want to draw your attention here to the probable effect concentration. We saw this a little earlier. 23 milligrams per kilogram, this is the concentration at which we would expect to see adverse effects on biota. And many of these lakes have concentrations of PAHs that exceed that PEC. And there has been some work since we first identified this as a source. There has been some research looking specifically at effects of PAHs associated with coal tar-based seal coat on different organisms and on ecological communities. There's a vast, I'm sure you're, many, you're well aware that there's a vast amount of research out there on PAHs in general or individual PAHs uh, on a wide variety of test organisms. Um, these research projects look specifically at PAHs from coal tar-based seal coat, and they saw um, chronic and sublethal effects uh, on a couple of different amphibians that were tested. Uh, they also saw measurable effects on ecological communities, changing the number and variety of species that were present. Uh, and just very recently, a paper has come out looking at DNA damage on Japanese Madaka associated with runoff from coal tar sealed parking lots. The next question then is, well, what about human health exposure? Because there clearly are a lot of ways that humans can come into contact with the dust on these surfaces, whether they are coming into contact during play activity or whether they're coming into, uh, whether they're breathing the fumes that are being volatilized from the surfaces um, or whether they are coming into contact with the PAHs where it contaminates soil or house dust. And in fact, one of the interests that we had in determining are PAHs from parking lots and driveways as they abrade and adhere to our, the bottoms of our shoes, are they being tracked into homes in the same way that, well, that other contaminants are? So we did a study in 2010. We looked at 23 apartments in Austin, Texas, 11 of those had coal tar-based seal coat on the adjacent parking lot. These were all um, ground floor apartments. And 12 of these either had asphalt-based, excuse me, asphalt-based seal coat or unsealed asphalt. And we measured the PAH concentrations both in the dust on the parking lot and in the apartments themselves. For the parking lots, we saw very similar concentrations to what we'd measured previously and in other parts of the country. Concentrations, median concentrations were in the thousands on the parking lots. We also saw higher concentrations in the house dust. The concentrations of PAHs and this uh, were about um, 25 times higher. And this is the sum of the carcinogenic, the B2 PAHs. And the sum was about 25 times higher in those apartments that had coal tar based seal coat. And Dr. Williams has uh, a couple of studies using this data along with data for PAHs in affected soils 
and looked at some implications for human health, and that's what he'll be talking about in just a few minutes. Another pathway for human exposure, of course, is, is air, is inhalation. And so we have been investigating also volatilization of PAHs from coal tar sealed parking lots. The way that we've done this, we've, we've used a, an approach uh, that was developed by Environment Canada using something called a hat sampler. Apparently, uh, people in Canada think that this is what a sombrero looks like. So they call this a hat sampler. And essentially, the approach is to use a puff up here at about 1.25 meters above the surface and compare concentrations between what's in the puff and what is collected in a puff that is underneath the hat sampler. And we use the gradient in concentrations and other environmental factors um, to estimate a flux. In other words, a mass of PAHs leaving a given surface area per unit time. The first work that we did was looking at parking lots that had been sealed anywhere from months to years earlier. So these are parking lots that have been in use, have been sealed for quite a while, have been exposed to sun and wind and rain and all, that, all those environmental factors. Uh, and we compared unsealed asphalt to coal tar sealed lots. When we compare the flux between the air over the unsealed parking lot and the flux coming off the coal tar sealed parking lot, there's about a factor of 60 different, even years after application. So it appears that coal tar pavement, coal tar sealed pavement continues to be a source of PAH to the atmosphere years after application. I want you to remember this number because the next study that we did investigated PAH fluxes from seal coat directly after application and how, that ap how those fluxes change over time following application. So we had two test plots sealed um, in Austin, Texas, uh, we, and we compared the concentrations of PAHs volatilizing off a coal tar sealed lot and compared that to what was volatilizing off an asphalt sealed lot. And we measured the concentration starting pretty much as soon as we could get out on the pavement. So just within hours of application, the applicators went nuts. We weren't supposed to walk on their nice wet seal coat. But we went out there anyway, and we continued to measure for um, first starting with hours and then days and uh, weeks following application. So remember this 88 number uh, from the coal tar seal coated parking lots that were sealed a few years earlier. That concentration is way out here. If we take a look at the flux from seal coated parking lots during about the first two weeks after application, we have concentrations that are in the tens of thousands of micrograms per square meter every hour. Looking at that more closely, so here's the first two weeks following application. And we have a diurnal cycle. It's hotter during the day, so we have more volatilization and a little bit less hot at night. Remember, this is Texas in the summer, so it's pretty hot out there. Um, and we, ex we com uh, compute the area under the curve, and we come up with a total PAH loss over the two weeks after application of about 2.5 grams per square meter of sealed lot. If we put that into context, we're going to do a little calculation here um, for national PAH emissions just during the first two weeks after application. So we have our numbers for annual seal coat use and area covered and our emission rates that we've measured of 2.5 grams per square meter. And if we multiply that through, we find that PAH emissions on an annual basis are about 1,000 megagrams or 1,000 metric tons which is on par or actually exceeding estimated vehicle emissions. So it turns out that this actually is a, a potentially important source of PAHs to urban air. So I'm going to circle back now before I, I, I pass the microphone over to Spencer and go back to our original question, because we've just had some research published this week that I want to share with you. The question is, 
are the PAHs that are ending up in those storm drains, are they really, like our models and our forensic evidence says, an important source of PAHs to lake sediments? And to investigate this, we had the opportunity to do a study in Austin, Texas, which was the first jurisdiction to ban use of coal tar-based sealants, and they banned them back in 2006. Prior to the ban, actually back in 1998, we had collected a sediment core from Town Lake. It was one of those urban lakes where we saw upward trends in PAHs. So we went back to, to Town Lake, which has been changed to be called Ladybird Lake now. We went back to Ladybird Lake 2012 and 2014, and we collected more sediment cores from the downstream end of the reservoir here. Um, and we also collected some bed sediment samples, which we could compare to bed sediment samples that had been collected back in 2000 before the ban. So here are the trends from the sediment core we collected in 1988. And uh, I apologize, this, this graph is from our publication and it's showing micrograms per kilogram. So actually parts per trillion, not parts per million. So divide by 1,000 to get back to parts per million like we've been talking about. So they range from 2 up to about 10 ppm. Here's the trend in the lake uh, core that we collected in 98. So we have a, a very statistically significant upward trend, an increase of about 20 times in the 40 years uh, of, of deposition. Now here are the results from the lake sediment cores that we collected in 2010, excuse me, 2012 and 2014 following the 2006 ban on coal tar-based seal coat. And then here's our bed sediments before and after the ban. If we compare the average concentration in the years directly preceding the ban with those from 2012 to 2014, we're seeing about a, almost a 60% decrease in PAH concentrations following the ban. So that was published uh, just this week in ES&T, and that's, that's something I wanted to share with you. If we use our source apportionment model on those sediments collected just before the ban, it was telling us that most of the PAHs were coming from the coal tar-based seal coat dust. We did the same thing for those sediments collected just recently. We see a decrease in concentration, but we still see that most of the PAHs are coming from seal coat as those existing stocks on parking lots and in stream bed sediments continue to be depleted, we expect to see that PAH concentrations in Ladybird Lake should continue to decrease. If you'd like more information about the USGS research, you can find it on this web page here, or you are welcome to contact either me or uh, Dr. Van Meter, who has, we've co-authored a lot of papers. Um, there have been quite a few publications now by researchers with other government agencies and also researchers with academia. Uh, all of this independent research has come to similar and consistent conclusions about the importance of coal tar-based seal coat as a PAH source to the urban environment. There are some publications that have come out recently that are by consultants funded by the PCTC, which is the lobby group that lobbies for the coal tar seal coat industry, and they are disagreeing with our results. Um, and if anyone would like access to any of these documents, please let me know, and I would be happy to share. My name is Spencer Williams. I'm at Baylor University. Uh, prior to being at Baylor University, I was a consultant. Um, I worked for a, for a small firm called Chemrisk. I was located in Houston. And in the course of my work there, um, I, I've worked for a long time with PAHs and dioxins and, and a number of organic pollutants. I happened to come across a publication from Barbara and Peter uh, on seal coat, and I thought it was very interesting, and uh, I, I continue to follow their work. And then a few years later, I had an opportunity to come here at Baylor and do some uh, scientific research, teach some students. And that very fall, um, I just happened to go into a room at, at the uh, Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, the annual conference, and who was standing up there giving a talk but Barbara. Uh, and so after the meeting, I walked right up to her and I said, I've been following your work. I'm very interested. Do you guys have time to chat? And we, uh, 
we started chatting about it, and I told them I was a human health risk assessor. And they said, how coincidental, we've been looking for someone just like you. So since then, we've uh, been having what I think has been a really interesting and, and productive conversation, and one that I hope is going to carry us uh, further forward. So in my previous life as a consultant, I, I became interested in contaminants in house dust, and I think that's first how I came across the work. Um, for those of you who don't know, house dust is a very important medium for environmental contact. Um, it, it's approximated that most people in the United States spend about 90% of their time indoors. And anybody who's worked on environmental lead, um, you know, one of the great success stories for public health uh, over the last 40 years, uh, is aware that dust is probably the most important uh, way uh, in which children come into contact with lead, probably the most. Soil is a, is a close second, and the relationship between these two media is very complicated. So. We started talking, Barbara and Peter and I started talking about this, and, and we started talking um, about it as, you know, that their interest was primarily environmental chemistry, environmental forensics, mine being sort of uh, human health and also ecological health. Uh, I was very curious as to what, you know, starting off with what these might look like in terms of how we know people are exposed to PAHs. And so, Real quick, I'll give a quick primer on that. Uh, Barbara told you quite a bit about PAHs. They are ubiquitous. You guys all had them for breakfast this morning. If you had just about any version of food stuff that you can get, they would be in your coffee. They would be in, like I say, just about everything you eat. If you go and have a hamburger, if you go and have barbecue, you get um, you know, a dose of PAHs for certain. Uh, so one of the things that we have, have been studying over a long period of time is how, how people come into contact with these by and large. And most studies have demonstrated over time, it appears that our primary uh, route of exposure for the general public to PAHs is through their diet, um, as I said. So uh, this has been pretty well characterized uh, through a number of authors. Uh, Charlie Menzi, uh, the incoming president of CTAC, has done some work on this. And, and in particular, we became very interested in a couple of studies, a couple of very robust studies that were done in North Carolina um, on children, uh, which actually, how they did the study was they um, had the parents prepare duplicate meals, the children would eat one meal, and then the other meal would be taken back to the lab for analysis. And so then they, would, they were able to, you know, determine, um, you know, approximate, a pretty good approximation has to be of, of the, the content of, the PAH content of these children's diet. And so we wanted to look at that as a point of comparison. So we, we also have some pretty good ideas about how much dust children tend to in ingest on a daily basis. Uh, you know, and, and for those of you who have kids, you know that this is sort of how children are learning about their environment. They move around and they stick their hand on everything and then they stick their hand in their mouth and they stick their mouth on windowsills and everything trying to get come to grips with their environment. And that brings them into contact with dust. This is certainly the case for uh, dust that's contaminated with lead-based paint, right? So that's, a, that's an important one. And, and the same sort of exposure would be expected uh, for the dust that Peter and Barbara were seeing in, in people's homes. And so we decided to start off with sort of the simplest way of looking at um, how much dust we think children ingest sort of in the, you know, on, on an average, and then how much sort of the, the reasonable maximum might be, you know, so sort of the 95th percentile. What do we think children are coming into contact with? And like I say, there have been a number of studies done on this. It's a very complicated question to answer because if you're trying to divide soil and dust, they, there's a lot of similarity in some, in some settings. Most of the dust will essentially be tracked in soil. In other settings, that's just not the case. Uh, and so, but starting with what we knew, uh, we, we, uh, there was a recent study done by a, by a group, uh, Ozkinak, you guys may know these authors, um, using the uh, Consolidated Human Activity Database to generate a couple of estimates of dust from hand-to-mouth and object-to-mouth behavior. And so go on ahead, Barbara. So you can see here we um, started on the left by showing what the concentrate, what your exposure to uh, B2 PAHs, so these are the, the ones that are listed as B2 or probable human carcinogens. Um, and what that would look like for your dietary ingestion. And those come from the studies in North Carolina. Then we decided to compare it with what we knew about the concentrations of these chemicals in uh, residences with coal tar sealed parking lots and then asphalt parking lots that were not sealed with coal tar. So on the left here, we're looking at these two bars in the middle. On the left, you can see 
that just having 27 milligrams of dust per day is going to give you a um, dust, a, 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 excuse me, an incident, incidental ingestion exposure to PAHs that is significantly higher than typical dietary ingestion for children of the same age. And so we felt like that was pretty remarkable. Most, most studies of PAH exposure um, show that it's, it's rare to find a source for the general public that will exceed that kind of an ingestion. So, and this is for children that are sort of in the average, you know, children that sort of eat the average amount of dust. Um, and then if you look at the right, we, we took the, it's about 100 milligrams per day. And I, I should say that 100 milligrams per day was sort of a default value for dust not that long ago. I mean, there are a lot of different values that people have settled on, but this is, we feel like these are, are the most robust that are available to us right now. And as you can see, you know, we're getting up towards 200 and 240 um, excuse me, uh, nanograms per kilogram per day compared to, you know, in the range of about 24, right around 25 uh, for dietary ingestion. And so we did believe from this uh, initial, just initial set of calculations that we could be looking at a significant expo source of exposure for PAHs for children in residential settings. And, and as, as you guys know, this, as you guys know, PAH exposures, they, they generally, you would think that most of your PAH, PAH exposures for general public come from dietary, but if you're looking at PAH exposures that are relevant and, and likely to cause significant problems, you'd be thinking about smokers, and then on the occupational side, you're thinking about people who work at Coke ovens, stuff like that. And so we decided to take the next step and go ahead and take the data that we had and start thinking about what this might mean for, for people in terms of their cancer risk. I mean, this is sort of, we followed sort of the default uh, parameters for Superfund, and, and knowing that coal tar and coal tar pitches, there's quite a bit of epidemiological evidence to support the idea that these are human carcinogens. Uh, and of course, as you all know, EPA has had a slope factor for BAP and related compounds for quite a while. This is still undergoing revision. We're, we're still, there's still an ongoing robust scientific discussion about this topic, but the bottom line is um, all of the evidence we have seems to center on the idea that these things do cause cancer. So in people. So go on ahead, Barbara. We'll go to the next one. So the next thing we decided to do is to, now this is sort of a simplification of a larger manuscript. And so what we decided to do was set up a scenario, a hypothetical scenario, in which people uh, who lived in, the, in these residences adjacent to coal tar sealed pavement were compared to the people who lived, uh, you know, it, were exposed to concentrations of PAHs consistent with uh, parking lots that weren't sealed with coal tar. And here you can see the differences in, in the risk. And so what you see over here on the left is something we would generally refer to as, uh, you know, in the area of de minimis. It was uh, mostly in the right around uh, 10 to the minus 6, so right around 1 in a million. Um, right around 1 in a million, as high as 3 in a million. Um, if you consider upper range exposures, then you can get something a bit higher. Um, but it, it, of course, is completely dwarfed by the, the theoretical excess lifetime cancer risk you would expect to encounter if you lived in an environment that was contaminated with coal tar or affected by coal tar. So what we're seeing here, of course, is um, concentrations in soil tend to be a bit higher. Soil adjacent to these spaces tends to be higher. That's not a huge surprise. Um, you know, much more cleaning you go inside the home. And so you can see that the predominant source of risk here is associated with soil. But even with house dust, we're reaching uh, a level that is in excess of 10 to the minus 5. And, and 10 to the minus 4 is generally the kind of range uh, for a Superfund risk assessment in which EPA would say, we're going to have to do something about this and we need to start thinking about it right now. But 10 to the minus 5 for a general population is uh, kind of a remarkable uh, number. I should also say the number that you're looking at right now, this is actually an average. This is not the, the reasonable maximum exposure. This is a central tendency exposure, so sort of the average of what we expect people to be exposed to. Um, and if you look at the reasonable maximum exposure, which means people are, maybe they're just eating a little more dust, they're coming into contact with a little more soil, it actually winds up being about 5 times 10 to the minus 4, which is a, a sort of an eye-opening number, or it would be in a Superfund risk assessment. So now, now what we're also looking at here is we're looking at a lifetime exposure. Uh, and, and 
we also, you know, just because of the nature of, of people, you know, people don't, some people do live in the same place for their entire life. And so we wanted to have a, have a look at this with regard to shorter spans of time. And so one of our exposure scenarios, we were looking at children who lived in these kind of settings basically from birth until right before they turned six years old. So, and we found at that time that these children, uh, in an average, were sort of in the four times 10 to the minus five range, so that's four in 100,000. But if you think about reasonable maximums, then we're talking in the area of three times 10 to the minus four. And so even just over six years of life in a, in a reasonable maximum exposure, you would expect children to be encountering uh, what most regulatory agencies would consider an unacceptable risk. We should also note at this time, uh, you know, Barbara mentioned that there had been some, uh, there's, there's an ongoing scientific debate, and certainly there are individuals out there who disagree with some of our conclusions along these lines, and, and that's certainly a conversation we're happy to have. Um, the bottom line is we, we, we did try to be very conservative uh, in the way we looked at these potential risks. And, you, you know, it, we, we did a number of things which we felt were consistent with what we felt the actual situation was. And, and we were um, encouraged at several points to, to use um, exposure parameters and risk assessment parameters, characterization parameters, that um, actually would have tended to increase our numbers. But we felt like the ones we were using were probably more reflective of the real situation. So, so with regard to that, ultimately, what, what, what the purpose of these two papers uh, in environmental pollution and environmental science and technology, the, the, the entire purpose of them really, was to point out that the exposures associated with these environments, these environments that have clearly been affected by coal tar uh, use in, in adjacent spaces, is a, can, seems to be associated with a strong likelihood of high PAH exposure for general population, for children in particular. And then we feel like they're, you know, under certain circumstances, are significant concerns for additional human health risk. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is not to say that, that many, many children are going to wind up coming down with leukemia or liver cancer or so forth from this, but simply that at this point, we've got to learn more about what we're looking at here. There is, there is truly not enough data. This is something um, that an area that is, is in dire need of further research. Um, this was a screening level risk assessment based on a theoretical exposures, and we would very much like to be able to fully characterize the exposure of children. Uh, that's a difficult question for lots of reasons, but that's something that we feel is going to be a critical area of research over the next uh, several years. So with that, I think I'll stop talking about the human health. And uh, I think at this time, Barbara and I will be ready to answer some questions from the audience. Spencer, I'd like to just add one point here, which is that the um, this, this um, human health risk analysis did not take into consideration either inhalation of PAHs in the air over the parking lots, nor did it take into consideration contact or um, dermal contact or non-dietary ingestion of the steel coat particles on the parking lot itself. So this doesn't take into consideration children's play activities, for example, on, on a steel coated driveway or parking lot. Yeah, that's absolutely right. This was purely uh, from, from oral ingestion. And the reason for that is what, that was our strongest data set. It's also the strongest data set on, on, ex, on exposure parameters as well. So thank you very much, Barbara.